Once a disciple asked the elder, Holy One, is there anything I can do to make myself enlightened? And then Holy One answered, As little as you can do to make the sun rise in the morning. Then of what use, the surprised disciple asked, are the spiritual exercises you prescribe? To make sure, the elder said, that you are not asleep when the sun begins to rise. I learned something from Buddhism that's been very useful to me. Uh, that meditation is a practice and that religion is what practice, what, what religion is, is a practice. It's something you do. Somebody asked it there, meditation, Buddhist meditation teacher, <clears throat> whether the practice of meditation caused enlightenment. And the teacher said, no, enlightenment is an accident. <laughs> but meditation makes you more accident prone. <laughs> uh, religion is a practice that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Its purpose is to help you access your profound humanness, is that religion is a practice. It is something you do. Now there's theoretics and thinking that goes along with these practices, but basically you do religion. It's, it's not that you just think new thoughts. You do something. Uh, you practice something. Uh, you, the intellectual part is, informs and is part of the practice, but it's not the essence of religion. Let me see the hands of anyone tonight who, uh, after you woke up this morning, uh, anyone who brushed their teeth. Wow, okay. Now l let me see the hands of everyone who has not yet brushed your teeth today. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, well, it's good to have some honest people. Um, <clears throat> So, what is a ritual? What is a ritual? It's an interesting question. I get in, I get in the car and I put on my seatbelt. A little ritual, maybe. Maybe it's more of a habit. Monday through Friday when I eat breakfast, half a cup of homemade granola with about a dozen raisins and eight cranberries and uh, a, th a, third of a, a third of a banana, you know, sliced properly. About a teaspoon of chia seeds and a couple of teaspoons of whey powder and some honey and then cover all that with some rice drink, about a half a cup. So you may ask yourself, you know, what's the difference between a ritual and obsessive neurotic uh, behavior. <laughs> Ritual is a way that you and I take this freedom that we are, and we invest some intentionality and some conscious awareness in a practice any practice. I'm going to practice a certain relationship to life. Rituals, which one of their key functions can be to connect us with our depth. And isn't it, isn't it interesting because we have conscious relationships that we invest an intentional orientation toward. We have so many of those in relationship to our bodies, right? and in relationship to our minds and in relationship to our social connections and our political affiliations. But isn't it interesting, isn't it interesting that while <clears throat> we invest this intentionality and this conscious awareness into the management of our teeth we sometimes are a little weak at managing this interior life. 
and all of the interior stories that hold all of our relationships to life, that in fact manifest as everything you and I know, do, and be. We're really great at investing this intentionality and this freedom and this conscious awareness in the management of our teeth, but sometimes we fall a little short when it comes to managing this relationship with the ultimate encounter. This relationship with the depth that I know first and finally I am. Isn't it interesting? What if I were to practice being in my life, being in all of my life, being in the depth of my life? I uh, was always um, allured and fascinated by uh, other dimensions of time and space from a childhood. And I began without much awareness to find an entry into that other time and space through rituals. Uh, one of the, if not the earliest childhood memory I had, uh, that I have actually, is a, of a ritual um, where I was crafting an altar to Jesus and Mary. We had a statue of them in our home and I climbed up on the little stool to put a piece of fabric like a bed sheet or a tablecloth underneath the statue so it would hold the cloth and I cascaded the statue down in front of this um, dresser drawer. I got off the stool and I remember cutting up pieces of bread and I took the ends of the cloth that were on the floor and I began chanting and um, and the bread would go up in front of these, the statues, and I was chanting and chanting and chanting. And, and I probably was chanting something noticeable that my father came and he um, took me away from that and said, stop it, what are you doing? Are you crazy? And I knew there was something there. And I, as a child, you know, you're in that state of consciousness of the magic, mythical stage, you know, the enchanted stage. And it, it, it became an increase of what I had done at four years old. Now I was in this beautiful building and there were these magnificent sounds from the choir and the, and the Italian community in Schenectady, New York, where I grew up, cherished the musical dimension of the rituals. And then there were the processions and then there were uh, devotions to the mother of God and to the saints and there were bones of the saints that were there. And this was a, uh, this was a wonderland for my imagination. And it just kept blooming and blooming. And these two priests, Father DiCaprio and Monsignor Spina, were just enlightened in the sense of their love for these rituals. And then the rituals moved from Latin into English when I was probably around Oh, I was maybe 10 years old, a little less. And they moved into the new language of English. So the veil of the, the, the mystical language of the Latin was removed. And it was bittersweet because there's something about the, the not knowing what the words are saying cognitively that allowed them to be opened quite experientially to the whole other dimensionality, that other space-time experience. So both Father DiCaprio and Monsignor Spina made the transition beautifully. They, 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 were, they did a beautiful passaggio into this other world of the English rituals without losing some of the majesty of the processions and the incense and the music and the uh, preaching that they, would offer, that they would do. That was highly poetic. Both of them were literary, uh, uh, you know, they were savants f f about of literature and poetry. So they were able to do this and I just ate it all up. 
And, and then my father and mother did not want me to go into the seminary. They did not want me to be a priest. They wanted me to be a lawyer. They said, with the, uh, <laughs> they said with the talent that you have of imagining things, you can argue any case and win any journey, jury over to your side. So I, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to be one of those myth makers. I wanted to be one of those ritual makers. I wanted to, I wanted to be an enchanter, a shaman. I wanted to be a priest. And I, and I felt that somehow, and this is certainly not part of our tradition as the Roman Catholic, but somehow it was a very ancient predisposition of mine to be this kind of ritual maker, priest person. It was there. We need some expression using language or how to use our body. And uh, some rituals such as, you know, making prostration. Or in Buddhist tradition, we do gasho. This uh, gasho and the bow. This, uh, I think this gesture, I think is the same as Western culture uh, as a, a shaking hand. Mm -hmm. That is, when we uh, put uh, these two palms together, we cannot hide anything. That means we cannot hide weapon. That, so this uh, gesture shows I have no intention to harm you. Uh, and from this position, we, we cannot attack the person in front of me unless we do something, one action, then the person can escape. So this means I have no intention to attack or uh, injure or uh, harm you. So this is an uh, expression of uh, friendship and respect and intimacy with the person. And uh, another way of making prostration is much more a polite way of expression. I think that came from the way uh, slaves or servant showed their uh, gratitude to their lord. That means when we make prostration in that case we have to put our uh, both hands, both uh, elbows and uh, forehead on the ground. That means we cannot attack at all, we cannot do anything. But the person in front of uh, you, uh, standing, can do anything. It's really vulnerable posture, without a perfect kind of uh, slander or obeisance. We cannot take this posture. And we do this in front of Buddha. And we hold our hands palm up like this. That means we, we place Buddha's feet on our uh, hands. And that is higher than our head. Our head is the highest point of our, our service. This posture means I put Buddha higher than myself. This is a kind of expression of I completely take refuge in Buddha and Buddha's teaching. And we do the same uh, posture uh, or prostration in front of uh, our teachers. This is a ritual, but this is the expression of uh, respect and uh, taking refuge. But, you know, unless we are uh, careful, we can do this without thinking. With uh, our mind is, or heart in the, in the form is really important. Form and mind or heart should be together. Otherwise, this simple, simply just form is not so meaningful. Every world religion, at the mature levels, discovers some forms of practice to free us from our addictive mind, which we take as normal. It isn't so much that people leave religion, 
as it is that they come to a moment in life when they go on beyond the system to the very source of the light. It is the plight of the mystic to enter the universe of God alone, where no charts or maps or signs exist to guide us and assure us of the way. It is a serious and disturbing moment, one after which we are never quite the same. There is a journey you must take. It is a journey without destination. There is no map. Your essential reality will lead you, and you can take nothing with you. What are the rituals managing my life? Are these rituals manifesting conscious intentions or unconscious habits? Are these rituals helping me to practice a life reflecting my deepest values? Do I have a map? This ultimate journey is taking some twists and turns I had not expected. Perhaps it is time to consider those who have explored this path before. I sense I am ready for my next teacher. Life's classroom awaits. Shall we enter? <laughs>